Um, my name is Tani Alvarez. For those of you who I haven't met before, welcome um, to today's annual update, part seven, understanding risks associated with hiring. Um, for those of you who have been with us uh, prior to the pandemic, you know that it's usually our hope, dream, and desire to have in-person um, meetings, and we do an annual update each January. I have good news that will be returning for 2023. It's going to look slightly different um, than it has in the past in order to keep people safe and healthy, but what we're going to do is do a half day session on Thursday, January 26th. So a half a day that I'll include a happy hour afterwards. And then we're also going to do a separate section, a breakfast session on Thursday, February 2nd. So if January 26th doesn't work for you with hope February 2nd will, we're gonna do some smaller groups um, kind of more generally. But we have a few more annual updates this year before we even get to, to 2023. And our next annual update is going to be on October 27th. Note that this is a change from our usual schedule. This is gonna be on the fourth Thursday of the month as opposed to the third. And it's going to be presented by Eric Altold and Anya um, Mickey Alina um, of the firm's Employee Benefits and Executive Compensation Group. And they're going to be talking about record retention, best practices for employee benefit plans. How much should you be keeping and for how long? They're gonna go through statutes of limitations pertaining to employee benefit plans under federal law. Um, but also recognize that ERISA's open-ended requirement to maintain employee-specific benefit determination records goes well beyond that limitation period. They'll also be highlighting legal compliance opportunities created by the new IRS pre-examination pilot program, which provides a 90-day window for plan sponsors to self-correct certain operational issues before an audit begins. So it's our hope you'll be able to join us on October 27th for that record retention um, program presented by our employee benefits team. Uh, without further ado, let's get started with understanding the risks associated with hiring. Now, those of you who have joined me in the past know that I really think it's important to lay out at the beginning what we're going to be talking about during the course of the presentation so that nothing comes as a surprise, or if you jumped onto this webinar thinking you were going to learn something that I never get to, that you know that kind of right at the beginning. So the things we're gonna be talking about today, we're gonna to be talking about um, assessing your hiring needs. We're gonna talk about job descriptions and advertisements, understanding bias and how it interrelates to the hiring process, interviewing processes and avoiding discrimination in the interview itself, choosing discrimination, um, best practices to limit liability when we choose candidates, employment agreements, whether to use them, how to use them, terms to consider, background check, how we communicate with applicants and record keeping. Now, within all of these topics, we're gonna talk about best practices to limit liability and also recognizing how we're going to kind of interrelate this with any diversity and inclusion programs that we already have set in place. So Anne, let's get started on assessing those hiring needs. So before we even, you know, place a job ad or create a job description, we are going to first assess what our employment needs are. Oftentimes, one of the things that I see organizations do is when an employee leaves, they immediately feel that a replacement needs to come in and they don't do an assessment. Do we need somebody else taking on these tasks? What tasks were this, was this person doing? Is this the appropriate kind of place for them to be housed within the organization? Is it appropriate for them to continue to report to the same person? Do we see an evolution of this position in the next year, two years? Um, do we have other people who are being underutilized who some of these tasks should be performed by them and, and this task can take on kind of a new dimension? That's going to be one of the first things that you as HR are going to want to push um, 
your leaders to be able to answer those questions. So when you have a leader who comes to you and indicates that they have a need, pushing back as to some of these questions to truly understand what the need is, is it a long-term need? Are there um, individuals in your organization who are underutilized? At a time in which kind of hiring is difficult, getting a good candidate in for a long-term period of time can be difficult. Understanding that you know the people that you have internally, maintaining them is going to be the best way to kind of continue to evolve and operate. And if you have underutilized employees, they're likely unhappy. Board employees oftentimes are, are, are not as productive employees. They're not happy employees. So think about who you have capacity and, and without overburdening them, making sure that you, know, you are using everyone to the fullest extent kind of within the organization um, to make sure that they have job satisfaction as well. So you're gonna look at job duties and responsibilities. You're then going to consider kind of what would be required versus preferred education or training. Is this a position where we can teach everything they need to do on the job? In a lot of organizations where the type of work that's being performed is very specific or the organization has different or specific expectations for their employees, oftentimes on the job training is going to be the best form of training. Um, also, think about whether or not people with extensive skills within the industry may be able to accomplish the task that you're looking for, even if they don't have a secondary degree um, or a technical degree in whatever it is that, that the job would require. Next, consider physical requirements. So often, we see job descriptions where if the position is not one requiring manual labor, um, construction, people who are working um, in um, engineering, or people who may have outside jobs that we don't see those physical requirements because people presume, well, it's a desk job, so it, there's no physical requirements. There's a lot of physical requirements, the ability to sit for extended periods of time, the ability to be in front of a screen for extended periods of time, typing and mobility of fingers and dexterity. Those are all important things that you need to keep kind of at top of mind when you're creating a job description and talking about physical requirements that may be part of uh, that position. Next, consider compensation, wages and benefits generally. So right now, um, I'm hearing actually from a lot of individuals within our society, this concern that new people are coming into their organization, but in order to attract and retain those individuals, the organization is paying significantly more to new employees than it is to its current employees. Be mindful when you post for a position what, what your range is that you're going to be able to bring this person in. And also consider how that fits with people who either currently have similar positions, who have positions that are actually at a higher rank or at a different level within your organization. And then also just generally kind of how people internally are going to feel if you do bring someone in at the level or kind of at the compensation base that you're considering. Additionally, consider other desired traits. Um, and you'll see my little parenthetical that are legally permissible. So what we're going to be looking for is, um, you know, is a person civic minded? Maybe we are an organization that is looking to like increase our civic activity. Do they seem to have that same, um, I don't wanna say belief structure, but kind of internal, are they going to fit within the culture of our organization? Um, somebody who's a good communicator. If it's retail, it could be somebody who can deal with difficult um, customers. Um, in order to de-escalate situations. It could be individuals who have different types of training that may not be traditional in, a, in an educational background type setting, but individuals who on their resume may indicate that they've taken training concerning third-party bystander intervention training or, or other kind of diversity and inclusion type training that's going to be important 
as your diversity and inclusion efforts continue to evolve. And let's go to that next slide. So in the same discussion, when we are talking about being very mindful of kind of how much we are, um, how much we are paying employees, also understanding wage and hour elements is really important. So the exempt versus non-exempt um, classification, recall for those of you um, who are new to HR, or don't have significant experience with wage and hour, Simply saying somebody has a salary is insufficient to determine whether or not they're exempt or non-exempt. Um, the exempt and non-exempt classification goes to whether or not the employee must be paid overtime. So some of the common exemptions that we see for exempt employees are the administrative exempt employees, executive employees, learned and creative professionals, highly compensated, um, highly compensated outside sales employees. One of the most common issues that we've been seeing lately is as it relates to individuals who are being classified as executive exempt. So recall that to be considered an executive exempt employee, you not only have to have satisfy the duties test, so have discretion and control over matters of significance, but you also have to be overseeing the work of two or more individuals who work at least 80 hours a week, and that's in total. So 80 hours of work a week is being overseen by that manager in order to be considered an executive exempt employee. Now, with the amount of moving between positions and between organizations that we're seeing lately, be very mindful that they have to have two individuals they're overseeing at all times. So if there's a period of time in which the individual is only overseeing one person, they're not executive exempt in that situation. So just be very mindful of who reports to this individual, who this individual will report to, and how that plays a role with the exempt versus non-exempt designation. And let's go to that next slide. So exempt, and we're just gonna spend a little more time on it because I am seeing kind of more issues with this. And it becomes sometimes awkward to change somebody around in the mid employment or even in the first couple of weeks of employment. So I'd much rather we put time and energy into determining whether the person is going to be exempt or non-exempt initially before we make the offer. So for an exempt employee, they're paid on a salary basis and the salary has to be at least, the federal minimum is $684 a week, but be mindful that in certain states it's going to be higher. So in Maine, it has to be at least $735.58 per week, okay? So in addition to that salary test, they also have to meet that duties test, right? So for our executive employees, overseeing the work of two or more individuals and having discretion and control over matters of significance. For our administrative employees, somebody who's working in an office environment within a segment of the organization, who has control over matters of significance and general discretion. Um, also rem remember, cause you may be thinking, yeah, oh, they don't really qualify as exempt, but I pay them a salary and we constitute it as exempt, but this isn't really important to me right now because the person never works over 40 hours a week. Okay, that's understandable. But be mindful that there is other rules regarding the exempt classification as it relates to um, pay deductions and limitations on deductions and pay that you can make if an employee is out of work but is out of PTO, is using PTO. Some of those rules also play a role in the exempt versus non-exempt classification. For our non-exempt employees, recall these are going to be individuals who normally are paid by the hour. Now, you can be a salary non-exempt employee, but in those situations, the employee needs to be regularly tracking all the time in which they're working, and they're going to be entitled to overtime for all hours worked over 40 in a work week. 
this doesn't mean that, you know, I work 45 hours this week and next week I get five hours of extra PTO or, or leave time. That's not how, how it works either for exempt or the non, excuse me, for the non-exempt classification. So just be mindful of that. Let's go to that next slide. Okay, job description. So we figured out what we need. We figured out if they're exempt or they're non-exempt. We've talked to the manager. Now let's put it down into words. The reason I like preparing a job description before I create um, kind of a job ad is um, make sure that you have the job description and then you can usually use very, you know, a lot of that in order to create your job ad. So you create your job description and that's going to then lead you to be able to appropriately advertise the job that you're looking for. Next, and something that is um, becoming more and more difficult for employers is where to advertise. As we have gotten to this remote culture where so many people are working remotely, I presume that many of you are experiencing what a lot of my clients are experiencing, which is that the normal avenues that were being used previously, so putting up a, an ad on an online kind of hiring forum is resulting in hundreds and hundreds of hits. Now, those aren't applicants um, that are, are qualified for the position, that live anywhere near the position. You're just spending a lot of time digging through advertisements that are not relevant to what you're looking for. Look in trade magazines for other avenues in which you can um, advertise. Consider going back to some of the more traditional advertising and kind of recruiting functions, whether or not that's job fairs or going to colleges and, and recruiting on site in those formats. Um, also consider the location of advertisements. Are you only advertising online, but you're in a manufacturing setting? Consider doing it at, at points of service, at, at different locations where people with the skill set you're looking for may regularly visit, whether that's a trade school or it, there's clubs and activities that kind of focus in on the endeavor that you're looking for. Um, make sure you're accurately describing the position. If this is a position in which routine is going to happen and the person's going to be doing the same thing day in and day out, be mindful that it's really important that you say that. Nobody wants to get into a job that says that it, you know, there's room for advancement or maybe they don't even want advancement, but for personal growth. Um, and they find out once they're there that actually that's not, um, that's not a possibility. You are then going to spend so much time and money and energy onboarding someone who's going to be unhappy with your organization. So being extremely accurate in describing the position, whether or not there's opportunity for growth, whether or not that's upward or just kind of generally within the organization is important. Also location and remote opportunities. It's important to understand, could this job be done fully remote? If so, that may change how you're advertising the position and the markets in which you're advertising. Be mindful, however, too, though, if you're employing people from all over the country, you've got a lot of laws that you're going to have to follow. Um, and maybe depending on the number of employees registering to do business in, in those states. So you'd have to have unemployment, you'd have to do workers' compensation. Um, you'd, if you're, you know, if there are state or federal, excuse me, if there are state or local um, anti-discrimination laws or posting requirements, you're going to have to be following those rules. So do you have the capacity as, the, as an organization to be employing people remotely out of state? That's something that you have to talk with your operational team about. If it's something that could be a hybrid in person versus remote, does it start off immediately with remote opportunities or is there an expectation that the person be physically present in the location for the first six months or some, for some period of time kind of more generally? Additionally, be aware when you're making job ads um, for language that could imply membership into a protected classification, okay? Recent college graduates, young and energetic, these both can create some age discrimination concerns. 
So instead of recent college graduates, use entry level, young and energetic, just stay enthusiastic. You don't care what their age is, as long as they're excited about the service or the product in which you're providing. Um, one to three years of experience. Well, what happens if they have four years of experience? Is that really going to matter? Um, so at least one year of experience is usually a better way to capture what you're looking for. Additionally, be mindful. There are significant studies that show that um, a woman, uh, an individual that identifies as a woman is less likely to apply for a position in which they don't meet all of the qualifications. So the more qualifications that you have, um, you know, the, the higher the likelihood is that if a female were to see that posting, that statistically they may not apply for it because they don't meet, meet each of the categories. So be mindful that in your job ad, you're really putting in there the things that are, are necessary and you're identifying what your absolute necessities are versus just things that would be beneficial. And let's go to that next slide. Now, throughout this whole process, as you're considering what the job description looks like, and then once we start looking at candidates, be mindful of implicit bias and whether or not implicit bias is affecting the process itself. So implicit bias is an unconscious association of different stereotypes with particular groups. So um, you see uh, an Asian applicant and you presume that they are good at math, right? That's a bias is, that's based off of a stereotype. So the stereotype being individuals of Asian descent are good at math and you're using your bias in order to then make your choice. Also be mindful of past employees or past applicants that you've had who may have similar credentials to people who are applying and make sure that you don't allow your bias against that past employee to hinder or interfere with your ability to assess on an individualized basis whether or not this applicant or candidate would be a good fit for the organization, okay? So be mindful of more general cultural biases that could be, or stereotypes that could be affecting your decision. Also be mindful of, um, past experiences you have had individually and how that could create bias in your mindset. Also, you know, Maine is a small community. Be mindful that if you're looking at someone's address, you're not making judgmental calls based off of what you know about the area and what you know about the, the homes or the residences that are in kind of the community that is shown on the address. Similarly, um, from a college standpoint, um, one of the ways in which we increasingly can create a more diverse work environment is to hire candidates from multiple different, whether it's undergraduate or graduate schools, or if it's a technical skill that we're looking for from different technical schools, because it's going to include a more diverse array of ideas and possible solutions that can assist our customers and clients and their needs. Also be mindful that implicit bias doesn't just um, involve people who are outside the group in question. So um, I identify as a heterosexual um, Hispanic female. That does not mean that I could never um, discriminate or have bias against other people who fall into my the same group of what I identify as. So be very mindful when you're looking at candidates that if there is somebody who has very similar identifications to kind of what your either belief structure is, how you identify your race and national origin, all of those things, right? You can still have bias against people who are, I say quote unquote, like you. Also recall that this is in no way related to a person's intelligence, their cognitive ability or other personality traits. Um, I say to my colleagues all the time, we, I present internally to the firm, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, how intelligent you think you are, 
everybody has biases and we need to acknowledge them and we need to slow down our thinking to limit the effect that bias has in our decision making. And not just from a hiring standpoint, but in all aspects of our relationships with other people, whether or not it's disciplinary issues, termination decisions, our general interactions with the public. But you know, focusing in on hiring can have a long lasting and almost a waterfall effect because if we don't choose um, an applicant to come in and to become a candidate, to potentially become an employee, that initial decision, if that has bias in it, it has a very far reaching effect because that person never becomes an employee and never joins and adds value to our organization. Let's go to that next slide, Anne. Okay. So Tani's just told you, you know, all the things, and I don't want to say all the things because those of you who have heard me talk about implicit bias know that I could do probably a, a two or three hour presentation on the topic. But let's focus in on ways from a hiring perspective that we can limit the bias that we know is prevalent in, in all people who are, are part of the hiring decision or even who maybe aren't part of the decision itself, but are a part of placing the ad, creating the ad, all of those things. So first, let's focus in on the job description and the advertisement for the position. First, have multiple people um, review the ad itself prior to posting and finalization. So you're going to want multiple sets of eyes on it, and they're going to be asking a lot of who, what, when, where, why questions. So those five very elementary questions. Why do we believe that this is a necessary Scale. What is it that we're trying to say when we say that they need to be strong communicators? How often is this person communicating? Do they need to have strong internal connections or is this more of an external facing position? Um, you know, the rest of the department, how would they be interacting with this person? And is this a quick moving department or is this one where there is going to be significant time for somebody to learn the different personalities and expectations within the position? Or are we looking for somebody who can think really thoroughly on their toes all the time because they are going to be peppered with questions either throughout the day or throughout the job itself? Um, having multiple people look at the job is also the job ad and the job description is also going to help make sure that your team is on the same page. There have been so many times where I've gotten people in the room and we've been talking about a disciplinary matter and nobody knows what this person is doing. One person saying they should be doing this, someone else is saying they should be doing that. And, and when I look at the job description, the things that people are talking about have nothing to do with, with what's written down. Having everyone come together is going to be helpful in making sure that everyone's on the same page about what the expectations are, how we're communicating that to the individual, and then what our output is going to be expected from the position. Another person who you're gonna to wanna to turn to and get either support or more information from is the person who currently holds the role. So if this is somebody who's given notice and is still with the organization, um, talk to them. Uh, do you agree with the way that the position was described previously? What would you change about this job description? Do you think that there's a skill set that you have that was really important um, to be successful in this position? Um, do you think that there is a skill set that you wish you had that you think would help you to become more um, proficient or um, successful within this position? All of those are going to be really important. And it's also going to limit bias as well. Let's say this was a bad employee. Let's say that your bias is, okay, so this person's leaving. We're really thankful that they're leaving because we don't feel they were a good employee. Part of that exit interview is to understand how they felt about the position. And maybe we have some blame about how bad of an employee they were. Maybe we weren't effectively saying what they were supposed to be doing. Maybe the job description includes nothing that they were expected to do. Getting that feedback is going to help to limit bias that, that we may have had about the position itself based off of how other people were performing it. 
Next, have we performed a wage audit to determine the pay scale and the, um, the position will fall within? It's really important that we've made that decision before we post for the position and start bringing candidates in, because it's highly likely that if you see some type of superstar candidate, let's say somebody applies for the position who we believe is way overqualified, but who would be just an amazing addition to the team, you can see that wage creep that's going to happen. We really need this person, so I want to pay them double what we had originally talked about. That's problematic because we have other people who are in, who are either in um, the pay scale or who may be peers in the pay scale who now are being paid significantly less than what you want to bring this person in. So keeping that in mind is is very very important. Um, next, um, is this scale and kind of staying with this same um, same topic about wages, is the scale or rate similar to what other employees in the position are being paid? That's going to make sure that you don't fall within a, a wage audit issue. Next, choosing to who to interview. Um, make sure that you have somebody who is very um, kind of aware of and understands what the needs of the organization are. Um, who is assisting in making the decision about who we're going to bring in for interviews. When you're making that determination and you look at experience that the person has, try not to focus in on biases you may have, whether or not that is, let's say they worked for the Democratic caucus and you are a Republican. So you say, nope, this person's not going to work within the position. Well, does politics have anything to do with it? Or is it just that you would prefer to work with somebody who's of a similar political um, belief structure as you? Um, when you look at people's volunteer community activities, um, are they community activities that you support or that you feel are important for our community? Um, gender as it relates to physical or sedentary um, positions. If it is a um, if it's a job that's going to require significant outdoor work, lifting, bending, twisting, you can't say, well, this isn't a woman's job or this isn't a man's job. You know, bring them in. If they can perform the physical expectations of the position, it should play no role at all what their gender identity is or, or how they um, identify. Let's go to that next slide, Ann. Okay, let's talk about how the interview, and we're gonna get more into that interview, to see, um, the interview as well, but how can we limit bias within the interview itself? Standardized questions is really ideal, especially for our entry-level positions. Um, but once we start getting into more C-level or higher positions, we're gonna want different questions. So have different questions for different positions as it relates to what the job duties, tasks, and responsibilities are and how to move from there. Also have a diverse hiring team. So have people who are within the chain of command, have people who are just within the organization and maybe aren't even going to work closely with this individual. When we're talking about diversity, don't just think of diversity of skin color, but think about diversity in all the different ways age, gender, political belief, socioeconomic condition, um, their position in the organization, whether they are a lateral or whether they're somebody who's been with the organization for 10, 15 years, uh, sexual identification, sexual orientation, all of these elements um, help to create different life experiences and, and to view both the organization and incoming candidates from a different light. And having their perspective within the hiring process is helpful in making sure that we bring in a candidate who's going to fit well with our culture. Let's go to that next slide, Dan. Okay, so the interview itself. Who are our interviewers? We're going to want some that are relevant to the position, whether or not they're um, people who the individual will report to or individuals who will be reporting to that position. We also need these to be people who are trained in interviewing. They need to know questions that are not okay to ask. They need to know how they are portraying themselves and the company. So often, um, you know, when I'm talking to individuals, I'll have managers who raise their hand and they'll say, the problem is, is like, I never feel like the interview is long enough because 
I get out of it and I think to myself, I didn't ask about this or I didn't learn about that or, you know, there wasn't any time for them to ask me questions. Here's the thing. A good interviewer kind of sets the stage and appropriately manages the time, right? When you introduce yourself in an interview, it should be very short and sweet. Hi, my name's Tani. I am a partner at Veril in the Labor and Employment Practice Group. That's all they need to know about me, okay? They might ask me more when I say, do you have any questions for us about Veril or what are your experiences here? Then I may get into some of my own personal experiences, but there is no need for them to know all kinds of personal things about me or my background or how long I've been with the organization, all of those things. And the reason why it's important not to start with so much about me or the interviewer is because it sets the stage, right? If I'm sharing stuff about how long I've been with the organization, my family, the things I like doing outside of work, the problem is, is that the person feels as though they need to reciprocate. And then they're going to be giving information that is unrelated to the position that's really based much more on kind of who they are as a person. Again, that's important, but I want to know about their ability to do the job, okay? Talk to me about your experiences at, you know, widget factory number two. You're saying that you automated processes and created a quality improvement pro program. Tell me more about that. That's just stuff you really want to dig into, not that they, like me, have two bunnies. And, you know, those types of personal things is great to connect on. But later, once you know that they have the skill set to potentially perform the job. Again, so that goes to asking good questions that assess the applicant's potential as an employee. Oftentimes, the script is most helpful for these type of things because it gets at the root question. Other things, you know, oftentimes when we ask questions that would be on a list of inappropriate questions. Do you rent or own your home? I'll say to people, well, why would you ask something like that? Why would that question even be one that you're thinking of? And they respond with, well, I wanna know if they're moving from out of market, how soon can they start? And I say, well, you just asked the right question. If you are offered this position, how soon could you start? It doesn't matter whether they rent their home, they own their home. That's information we don't need or desire, right? Just ask, when could you start? Um, avoid asking personal questions, even if you're interested in some of those things, right? So you see somebody has a similar passion or interest to you, and you start the interview asking about, oh, I see that you, you skied in junior nationals, kind of tell me about that experience. Does that have anything to do with the position you're applying, you're asking them to apply for? You can save those questions maybe for round three or round four of interviews if, if it gets to that point. Use those first couple of interviews though to really assess whether or not this person has a skill set you need. Let's talk about some of the risky questions that we should be avoiding on this next slide, Anne. Do you have a car? I don't care if you have a car or not. What I want to know is, can you get to work? The only reason having your own car is going to be important is if the job description itself indicates that having your own car is a responsibility because you have to drive for work using your own personal vehicle. Similarly, do you have young children? The presumption would be if you have young children, they're going to get sick, they're going to have to take more time off. No, just say, do you anticipate having any problems reliably working the shifts that are set forth here? I don't care what the reason is that you can or can't come into work. I just need to know whether or not you can commit to being at work. Um, we don't ask about most recent salary. We understand that that's a violation of main law. So instead you're going to say, this job pays X. Is that consistent with your expectations? Um, being you know, a part of hiring committees for organizations that I'm a part of recently, it's important to say this right up front in that first interview, because otherwise you get all the way into the process, you go to make an offer and the person's like, whoa, we're way on different pages about pay here. We're never gonna ask about disabilities and instead we're gonna focus on these are the essential functions of the position. Can you perform these essential functions with or without an accommodation? Those are the ways that we're going to kind of, you know, make sure that we're asking questions that limit risk and exposure for the company. And let's go to that next slide. 
Okay, so what about when we have somebody who is making the risky statements and we're not asking for it? So we have, let's say, the overshare in an interview. Oh, I left that job because I was going through a divorce and my, um, my ex-wife spent a bunch of money and I was going through a bankruptcy and then um, come to find out I had liver cancer, like, all of a sudden, you just get all this information that you don't need, right? We need to be very careful that we're not in, we don't create a mindset or a bias where we have some type of caretaker responsibility. Let's say they're sharing something about their parents or a spouse or, or children and an incident that occurred in which they needed to care for the individual. Um, and instead, you need to be prepared to pivot. Oh, you know, I'm sorry, to, that sounds like it was a tough time. Let me ask you a little bit of, more about X, Y, and Z. So be prepared to cut the person off, okay? And it may feel heartless and it may feel as though like, oh gosh, I don't wanna be rude, but the, we're not there in the interview to talk about whatever the person is oversharing about. We need to get back to the topic at hand, which is their qualifications for the position, okay? If the employee, uh, excuse me, if the applicant um, keeps bringing it back to um, personal matters, it would be completely appropriate to end the interview early. So I've ended interviews early um, and sometimes the rest of the hiring team will look at me and they'll say, what happened? And I'll explain, I was going to be a no, no matter what on this. And because they kept sharing so much personal information, I didn't want to hear anything further because I think it was going to just open up additional doors that could create liability. This is one of the reasons why training interviewers, inter people who are part of the interview process beforehand is so, so very important. When you're doing the training, you should have somebody, you know, do a mock interview where the person just keeps oversharing. Um, I talk about exercising the muscle, especially as it relates to bystander intervention and harassment kind of generally. Exercise the muscle related to telling, you know, stopping an interview, telling people how to pivot, those types of things. They're difficult to do in the moment. So the more we're able to practice it, um, the, the easier it's going to be as a process. Next, what do you do with the information after the interview? Let's say you learn something that you wish you hadn't learned. Do not go and share that with the rest of the hiring team. You're gonna take it to someone in HR who's not part of the hiring decision and say, during the course of the interview, I learned this. I'm not sure what to do with it. It gave me reservations or, you know, what, what do I do now? It could be that they revealed a, a disability and an accommodation dialogue potentially needs to occur, um, but take it to someone in HR who's outside of the hiring decision. If you're a small organization and you don't have somebody in that capacity, still take it to the hiring per person in charge of hiring kind of from an administrative standpoint, not the person who operationally would be overseeing the position because that's going to limit potential liability for a failure to hire claim based off of a discriminatory intent. Let's do that next slide now, Anne. Okay, choosing a candidate. So you've done interviews, you, you, you created your job description, you posted for the position, you chose who to come in, you perform the interview, now you're in the position where you need to choose a candidate, right? Okay. There's the internal versus external applicants and things to consider relating to the dynamics moving forward as to, to, to that. If we choose an external candidate, how will we communicate this to our internal candidates to make sure that they understand that, you know, you're going to be asked to work with this person. We think it, that it's important that you, you work well with them and that you understand why we made the decision that we made um, because you could be creating very difficult dynamics if an internal candidate didn't get the position. Um, so that's gonna change kind of some of the communication. You're gonna seek diverse input. So diverse input should achieve a more diverse result. You're gonna ask a ton of why questions. Um, so when you're part of a hiring team, and I believe very strongly in a hiring team, it shouldn't be one person making a decision because there's an increased likelihood for bias to affect the decision. 
but why do you believe this person would be a strong addition? Um, what part of the interview led you to believe that they could effectively lead X, Y, and Z position? A lot of why questions should be asked. Um, additionally, in, in addition to the why questions, some what questions. Um, if somebody says, I couldn't stand this candidate and I didn't like them. And when you try to dig in and say, but why? Like they can't verbalize it. Next, we need to understand kind of some things that are going on with the interviewer themselves. What were you doing the half hour prior to interviewing this candidate? I, a major deal had just fallen through and I found out that our last shipment didn't arrive on time. Okay, that's going to help us understand that the mindset that you went into this interview with was really negative. So now all of your feedback about how horrible this candidate is may be affected by bias. Um, what did you do to prepare for the interview with this candidate? Well, nothing. I hadn't even looked at their resume until I sat down, okay? All of those things help us to frame the information that's being provided by our interviewers. Um, next, we're always looking at our own and potentially other people's implicit or explicit bias. Um, are you saying that you've had bad experiences with people who came from this organization or this college? Did that affect your decision? Um, do you like this candidate because they are quote unquote like you or do you not like this candidate because they are not like you? I'm really trying to create a more diverse environment is going to be something that we're focusing on. And the more people say like, oh my gosh, this person reminded me of me when I was that age or, or they're just like me, we're gonna be best friends. That may not be the best choice. We already have a person just like you, it's you. We want a more diverse kind of team. Um, next slide, please. Next, we're going to consider whether or not we want an employment agreement. And if we decide that we want some type of contractual arrangement, whether or not it's going to be an at-will agreement, which means that either party can terminate um, employment as they see fit, whenever they see fit, or if we want um, a, a term, so a period of employment for a term, whether or not it's for years, months, um, with the understanding that if either party were to breach that term and attempt to leave prior to the expiration of the period, that one person would experience a detriment that they would owe to the other person for leaving beforehand. So both are permissible, um, but then be mindful of other provisions that you would want in an employment agreement, confidentiality provisions, non-solicitation or non-compete provisions. There are significant um, limitations for non-compete um, statutes kind of throughout New England. Also, um, when we're talking about employment agreements, even if we maybe aren't going to have an employment agreement present, it could be that the employee is bound by restrictions from a prior employer. So be mindful of hiring from competitors and whether or not the individual themselves has an employment agreement and what the obligations are that the employee has for their past um, as it relates to their um, relationship with past employers. Um, so you may want to ask kind of if you're getting close to making an offer, hey, I wanted to double check if we were to make an offer of employment, do you have any restrictions on your ability to perform these tasks? Find out if they have limitations from a prior employer. Let's go to that next slide. Offering the job. So while you can have an employee contract, you're not required to. Okay, if you choose not to have a contract, it does make sense to have an offer letter, which at least makes sure that both of the parties are on the same page. So what's the title of the position? What's the start date? Who will they be reporting to? What's the rate of pay? How often will the person be paid? What hours are you expected to work? Not just hours of work, whether or not it's, you know, our base time of operation is eight to five, but also full-time, part-time, seasonal when the individual will be eligible for benefits and what they may need to do in order to, to be eligible. Um, conditions of the offer. So all offer letters, in, in my opinion, should include this offer is conditional upon your passing a background screening, if your organization does a background screening, and your ability to show that you're eligible to work within the United States pursuant to completion of an I-9 form, right? And then you're gonna to wanna to confirm if the relationship is at will or if it's for a term. If it's for a term, again, there should be that 
um, employment agreement, but otherwise, if you're just doing kind of this offer letter, confirm that it's at will employment. Let's go to that next slide. So if you are somebody who does background checks and testing, it should occur after the offer letter has occurred. So it shouldn't occur before, it should be a conditional offer, and then you're doing background checks and testing. So uh, reference verification, you could use both listed references and industry connections. There's pluses and minuses to both. In most situations, listed references are going to speak highly about the individual. Industry connections, however, you know, potentially can get you information that you don't want um, about the candidate or that could create um, discriminatory intent, you know, data that you're not looking for specifically. Skill tests um, are also helpful. Um, medical tests, depending on the position and whether or not there is lifting um, that may be required, lifting, bending, twisting, if it's a more physical job, drug testing. Um, recall that if you're in Maine, you have to have a uh, uh, Department of Labor approved drug testing program, or you have to be subject to Department of Transportation drug testing under federal law. Um, criminal background checks, uh, be mindful that this should all only occur after kind of that offer has been made unless you are in an industry that permits it to be uh, to occur prior to that. We have main law, the ban the box law that um, limits the ability to ask about or advertise kind of uh, past convictions as limiting an employer, a employee's ability to be successful in a position in initial job ads. Um, credit checks. There are very few times where a credit check is going to be, you know, helpful, I think, in analyzing a position. I know a lot of banks continue to, to perform credit checks. Um, there's no law that requires kind of the credit checks to occur. However, the EOC has put out, you know, multiple um, pieces of guidance indicating that in most situations, credit checks, unfortunately, discriminate against individuals who have experienced a condition that's outside of their own control, a uh, health condition, a divorce, um, some type of accident in which they may have been uninsured, like you know, medical, medical kind of condition accidents. Um, then there's also social media and Google searches. In this day and age, you definitely should have somebody on your team who is doing kind of a scan on social media and Google. It should be somebody who is outside of the decision making who's looking at it. And the reason for that is because they might find protected information that's unrelated to the um, employee's eligibility for employment. Um, and that information we wouldn't share with the hiring team. We would have just a list of things like if you find banter online that is of a rate you know that is racist in tone or that you know is diminishing of people of of national origin or those type of things those are people from a pr perspective who we may not want likely want representing our organization um versus hey you know there's some stuff in here that shows that they have run try for cure because their mother died of breast cancer last year that's protected information under GINA that we don't want or need. But the information about kind of using foul language and bad mouthing former employers, those are pieces of information that we're going to use to assess whether or not this is a person who, you know, will be a good fit in our organization moving forward. Let's go to that next slide. Uh, new hire paperwork. So remember, you're going to need that W-4 form and the I-9 form and verification. Um, one of the big things from a risk standpoint that I've been seeing a lot lately is incomplete or improperly completed I-9 forms and specifically for remote employees. You have to have somebody physically present with your remote employee checking their documents. You cannot do it the way we're doing it now on Zoom and have the person hold up their identifying information or send scans or faxes of those documents. Somebody has to physically be there to assess the validity of those documents, even when the individual is, is working remotely. 
So be mindful of that expectation um, when you're having someone complete new or higher paperwork. Uh, next slide. Unsuccessful applicants. How do we communicate to individuals that they've been unsuccessful and that we've chosen someone else? First, it's important to notify people. You don't want to become known as an employer who just ghosts people, who never responds after they receive an application, and specifically who doesn't respond if they brought people in who vote who um, have interviewed, that becomes even worse and leaves a bad taste in everyone's mouth. So consider the stage in the interview process where you're gonna notify someone. If, if you have a pile of people who by no means are going to get the job no matter what, let them know sooner rather than later. Thank you for your interest in the position. Um, you've not been chosen for an interview for this position. We wish you all the best of luck. Um, there's going to be different strategies as to whether or not you have an internal or an external candidate and how far along in the process um, the person has gotten. With more information being shared in, with our internal candidates who have gotten further along in the process versus our external candidates. But if we have internal candidates who have applied for a position, which they're not qualified for, we have performance issues with, we're going to want to sit down to that employee and have a larger discussion. Hey, we've seen you apply, you applied for this position. Just so that you know, you're not going to be asked to come in an interview. And these are the reasons why. You're currently on a performance improvement plan. We believe that you've exhibited unprofessional behavior in X, Y, and Z format. You are tardy in, in completing assignments. Be very honest because otherwise this person's going to continue to apply for positions and not understand why. And we know that, you know, 20% of our employees take up 80% of our time. And if we're not really upfront with that employee kind of at initial stages, we're going to continue to see more applications and just a general lack of understanding as to why the person isn't being chosen um, generally. Also, um, how do we respond for requests for additional information? Um, it depends on what information is going to be asked. We want to keep, you know, certain information private, but if it's such as, I'm really interested in applying for positions again in the future, can you provide feedback as to my resume or, you know, my interview? I often, if there's typos in an applic if there's typos in a resume and I've brought the person in for an interview, I'll say to them, just in the future, be mindful. You have, you know, some misspellings on here. And, and I would suggest you take a, a closer look at that on, um, you know, should you be using this application, this resume again in the future. Um, we have a question um, kind of about um, searches in the background check about not doing social media or Google searches on candidates as you may get information that could create bias. You should have somebody who is outside of the decision-making um, group who is doing a check and they should have a checklist. What we're looking for here are images that could put the organization in a poor light. We're looking for um, newspaper articles that indicate that they have been violent or that they have committed a crime. Some of those type of um, things that would be concerning. The person who is making the hiring decision or plays any role in the hiring decision shouldn't be doing Google searches or social media searches because that could create bias um, for that individual. But you should have somebody who's outside of the hiring circle who does that search to make sure from a PR standpoint that we don't have a larger issue or that if there's a gap or an issue, I've seen multiple times where somebody is, we've learned that someone's lying on their resume, that they actually were working somewhere else during a period of time. So to check to make sure that, you know, is what's online, is what's, what's set forth here, um, the same as what we're seeing on the application. So we're seeing more and more people who are leaving positions off of their resume because it ended poorly, whether or not it was because they got into a, a public disagreement, if it was a public employee, um, and the newspaper is showing that there was a, a larger scale disagreement regarding the position, or they sued that employee, or, you know, those type of, of situations that, that we're seeing 
because there's so much more information available online. The big thing is making sure you have the right person and you're not taking the activities and behaviors of a third party uh, and connecting them to um, the applicant. So you need to be very mindful that you have the right person as well. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so record keeping, document everything. Your background check process should also be documented. You should make sure you're keeping documents for the appropriate length of time. I've shared in the past kind of what to keep for how long. If you don't have that document, reach out and I'm happy to provide it to you. And then make sure you're maintaining confidential information in appropriate spaces. You may be getting medical records in the, after you've made the offer and you're doing a medical review, make sure that's in a separate folder. Uh, real quick, Ann, next slide. Oh, perfect. Okay, so I apologize to everyone. One minute over. Uh, I'll stay on for a couple more minutes if people have questions. Otherwise, thank you so much to everyone. Um, I hope that you have a great rest of your day.